Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Thank you. I hope you had a great weekend. It's nice to see you back here, ready to rock and roll in our calculus class today. And so we're building, continuing to build on our notion of function behavior as it relates to limits, evaluating them graphically, numerically, algebraically, analytically, without a calculator, but thinking about function behavior in terms of our, our head, right? And continuity now from last class. And so now we have the calculus definition of continuity. And in fact, that's how we begin our discussion today. So at this time, I ask that you take a look at your, your answer for your bell. Raise your hand if you did not get a red mark for today, the 14th. Did everybody get a red mark? Awesome. What must be true for f to be continuous at x equals c? What's our calculus definition? This is our nine stamp with a limit and an equation. What can we say in a nice one succinct, one succinct statement in order for f to be continuous? Hayden? Uh, the limit of x is closer to c of f of x equals f of c. Thank you, Hayden. So the limit of f of x as x approaches c has to equal f of c. That is, the value of the function at x equals c must equal the value of the uh, the function, the y values are approaching as x gets closer and closer to c. That sums up our whole intuitive understanding of continuity, that is, being able to trace along the function from left to right without having to lift your pencil right up off the page. That's our intuitive definition of continuity. Now here's our calculus definition of continuity. So my y values that are being approached from either side right, must equal the value that the function takes on for all my x values c in the domain of the function. Awesome. Right there, you have that already. You could have had k's too, you know, depending upon your notation or g's. Way to go, you guys. Thanks. All right. Now let's find a so that a function m of x is continuous at x equals negative 2. Well, Hayden told us our requirement. We need the overall limit to exist and be equal to the value of the function. However, we notice we have a piecewise defined function. So depending upon which, which side of x equals negative 2 we're looking at, the function is going to be given by a different piece. And so let's go ahead and consider my left hand, my left hand limit first. I'll need to consider my left hand limit and my right hand limit in order to get my first requirement, that is the overall limit. So let's go ahead and consider my left hand limit. Okay. So the limit of m of x as x, ooh, that's a tongue twister. The limit of m of x as x approaches negative 2 from the left-hand side, go ahead and tell the class which piece I'll be using to consider this left-hand limit. So which piece of my function definition will I use? Paul? The top one. The top one, good. We're letting x get closer to negative 2, but from the left-hand side, so we must use the top definition, that is x cubed plus 2. As x gets closer to negative 2, then x cubed gets closer to negative 8 plus 2. I drop my limit evaluation once I realized my x values, x equals negative 2, was in the domain of the expression. So I didn't have to continue with my limit once I did the direct substitution. So I'm getting negative 6. Now let's consider the right hand limit. The right hand limit is the limit of m of x as x approaches negative 2 from the right hand side. We'll go ahead and use my other definition, my 2 minus ax squared, as x approaches negative 2 from the right-hand side, because that piece of my function holds true when x is greater than negative 2. And certainly values that are approaching negative 2 from the right-hand side are greater than negative 2 itself. All right? Is negative 2 in the domain of this uh, quadratic polynomial? Absolutely. So we can do direct substitution. I can drop my lim limit and go right to the 2 minus a negative 2 squared, and this is an order of operations question, negative 2 quantity squared would be 4 times the a out front is 4a, so 2 minus 4a, I'm getting 2 minus 4a, yes? So I've got my left hand limit, I've got my right hand limit, in order for my overall limit to exist, what must be true given my one handed limits? So in order for my overall limit to exist, what must be true? Savannah? They need to be equal. They need to be equal, right? In order to have this first requirement that Hayden gave us, the left-hand side, I need my left-hand limit to equal my right-hand limit. So I've done the one-hand limit considerations. Now for the overall limit, I must have these be equal to one another. So we'll go ahead and set my left-hand limit 
negative 6 equal to my right-hand limit, 2 minus 4a, and solve for a. Now I'll give you my first piece. Here we go. 2 minus 4a. Uh, I'm not racing. I'm going to do that by the way. equals 1. I do that right. 6. Oh, no. Negative 8. That's wrong. That's what you get for racing. So subtract to a negative 8. And then divide. So I get a equals positive, positive 2. We didn't get a equals positive 2 for the overall limit requirement. That's great. Now we need to get the, li the last piece. But it turns out, given my piecewise definition, we've already found our last piece. That is f of c. In this case, would be m of negative 2. Which rule would I use? I would use the top rule. And so my m of negative 2. I would use my top rule for the or equal to, for the or equal to, and I would get negative 2 cubed would be negative 8 plus 2. We've already done this. And so we've already done this evaluation. We've already used that piece in our left-hand limit. Because this is an or equal to, this is kind of an extra piece. It was already built into my left-hand limit. But we nevertheless should consider that because our requirement says that our overall limit must equal the value of the function. So the value of my function is negative 6. That's the same as my left-hand limit. I had to make my right-hand limit equal to two of those, and I did so with an a value of 2. Awesome. What questions do you have about that number 2? Yes, Annika. Um, why can you, or like, can you just make um, the solve for a by doing x cubed of 2 equals 2 minus a x squared? Say that one more time. So can you make the two equations equal to each other in order to find a? Yes. Like, is it bad if you skip doing like from the very the limit part? <laughs> like right away, you just plug like it two to the right. Like that oh, yeah. still equals two, but we didn't. They, they wrote everything except, the except this. Yeah. Got you. Okay. So I think that I now understand your question, right? Okay. And. I want to tie in our limit notation and the calculus definition to this word right here, continuous, right? Continuous. And so I want to verify that the overall limit of the function is equal to the value of the function at x equals negative 2, my c value of concern. In order to do that, I technically, lead, technically need the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit in order to talk about the overall limit, all right? It turns out that because of this definition, my value of the function was built into the left-hand limit, but we should be writing that. We should be writing that to show the reader that we know we need the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit to both be considered in order to get the overall, the overall limit. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How should we write our answer? Like, do we just need to write a equals 2? Or what did you write with, like, m of negative 2? Uh, let's see. So a must equal 2 in, in order for m to be continuous. And so I think this is sufficient because the direction is said to find a so that m is continuous at x equals negative 2. So I, I think this is OK. This piece right here was sort of extra okay. because of this or equal to. If this or equal to wasn't there, these were both strictly, then we'd have to go and consider this piece and perhaps go somewhere else to find it, right? Because we need this. We need both sides of this equation. Without this. M of negative 2, technically, all we've done is shown that the limit exists. Okay. The overall limit exists, which is necessary. We need the left-hand side to match the right-hand side for the overall limit to, to exist. But we need that overall limit to equal the value of the function right, in order to be continuous. We need to plug the hole in effect. right? Awesome. Good question. Other questions about number 2, the second one? All right. Let's go ahead and take care of our housekeeping. So we've got our OTL number 3. Please give yourself credit at this time for those who complete out of 33. And also use a stapler. And so if you have multiple pages, I'd ask that you go ahead and staple those together. There's a stapler on the front side table. Uh, over on the activity table, there's another stapler if you have multiple pages. Give yourself credit for those who completed out of 33. Divide, enter, multiply by 2, and then round your infinite canvas score to the nearest half point, 0 to 2. Box that nice and big on top. Make sure that your name, 2A, and number 3 are clearly labeled on the top of your OTL. And when you're done, if you could kindly pass from the back to the front, front rows, make sure they're facing the same direction.
then they're easy to record and get back to you the next class period. So thanks for your help with that. I appreciate it. I don't need the materials in. Because I, I want to I do that for free and stuff, but that's fine too. And then I try to get back to you next time. So have it. Okay. So that's fine to do it right now. Okay. Okay. Pretty good. Thanks, you guys, for your help getting your assignments each and every day. I appreciate that. Okay. So as we, right, as I know on, on the Moodle schedule, this has been up since the very uh, beginning, since you self-enrolled, I just want to make sure that you're comfortable setting aside your blocks of time and preparing so that you're ready to go for our first unit test. We've already got the unit circle quiz in Infinite Campus, but now we're going to be having our unit test, and that'll be worth 100 points in Infinite Campus, which is significantly larger. So today, today we're looking at the intermediate value theorem on 9 8 a Wednesday. We'll be looking at limits and function behavior, and we'll also have some review time built into class. And so while our, our discussion on limits and function behavior is fairly short, you'll have a nice chunk of class time to work on the concept guide and uh, review. And then on Friday for us, a day, we'll be taking the unit two test, which involves limits. I did put a course event uh, last week, a Moodle course event, with the description of the different things that'll be assessed on the test. And so make sure you check that out on Moodle. You can click on upcoming events on the or go directly to the calendar and click on the event to show the description. After the test, we're going to get started on our uh, on our next unit introduction to derivatives, which is great news because you guys have already been introduced to derivatives in pre-calculus and in FST slash pre-calc. But we're not going to be having a whole group discussion. You will have full time for your test. When you finish, then you can get started on, on your first assignment, which is a kind of a reminder about derivatives and rates of change, right? Rates of change um, that you've seen in the past. Uh, and so I've spoken with Ms. Schrader. Um, and check out things, and so I know that you guys are going to be well equipped to, to handle our introduction to derivatives, and then as we get into more complicated derivatives in this course, and so I'm super excited about that. We can really get to the, the, the meat of the course in terms of applications. Limits are the basis for differential calculus and integral calculus, right? The bulk of the Calc 1 and Calc 2 courses at the, at the college level. So we need to have those limits, we need to have them first, but we don't do a lot of stuff with the limits. They're a necessary component for conceptually developing derivatives and integrals, but most of the stuff that we do is with derivatives and integrals and calculus um, for the AV course. And so I, I, I'm excited about that. You can kind of tell, I can scarcely contain my enthusiasm. This is such a great course. Um, and we have to have this limits piece as a foundation on which to build, but then we'll really be able to take flight when we get into some application of derivatives and, and uh, integrals. Awesome. So that's where we're going. Make sure that you're setting aside a little bit of time between now and Friday. And don't count on right just this time in class as your only review time. Right? You want to be thinking about how can you break it up, uh, maybe form a small study group with one other person or two other people. So kind of a max of three would be a great um, thing to do as you develop your skills for college. You can get in the habit of forming little study groups. It can be very helpful. When you get bigger than three, it can sometimes turn into a gripe session, and you don't want that. You want it to be productive. And so, you know, by keeping it kind of a smaller study group, that can be great. You can exchange numbers and everything like that. Annika? Are you going to get a review packet? Yeah, you will be getting a review guide, uh, and it will include review problems on it that are specifically designed for the unit test. However, uh, it won't be like a it won't be like a, a packet. You know what I'm saying? Um, that, that mirrors the test. Uh, instead, it'll be it'll be conceptual problems. Um, that are directed at getting you to review for the test. So yes, you, this day's assignment will be a review assignment. Awesome. All right, and now it's time for your daily dose of finding limits analytically. And I can't think of much more exciting things to do than that. So once again, we've got our comfort zone, our familiar graphing calculators, right? And we're trying to put them sort of on the back burner, right? As we think about limit evaluation using our brain and our knowledge of function behavior. And you guys have a wealth, right? A wealth of function behavior knowledge that you've been developing over the past three, four years. You've got your library of functions, 
right? You've got your library function. You already have a good understanding of, of, of continuity. And so these things are going to come in handy when you go to evaluate them and you're not allowed to use a calculator. Now, we will use our graphers to verify some of these. And so let's go ahead and scoot your attention back to your note sheet. Today, we're going to determine to give an analytically first for several examples. We'll check graphically for a couple of them. And then we're going to go ahead and add our last big piece uh, of the unit two, which is the intermediate value theorem, uh, which is an easy concept um, to understand and then a little bit trickier to apply, but we'll do a couple together. So we'll go ahead and consider the given limit analytically and then verify graphically or numerically. So in general, whether we're dealing with an algebraic function, a rational function, or in this case, a trigonometric function, we know that we can evaluate a limit, right? We can evaluate a limit. If my x value concern is in the domain of my expression, then all I need to do is direct substitution. Even if I can't evaluate the limit through initial substitution, I still always want to do it to see what I'm working with, see what kind of animal we're dealing with. So I would pose to you the question, is my x value of concern in the domain of my um, function, my expression, G? Yes, and so uh, the value of the limit I, I can get simply by a direct substitution. So this is the same as sine of zero, and that, of course, is zero. And so sometimes ain't nothing to it but to do it. I can evaluate my limit through direct substitution. That's easy cheesy. Uh, what if we let x go to infinity, though, with my same simple, simple expression, sine of x? As x goes to infinity, is there a particular y value that my function values approach as x gets larger and larger? No, Sammy? You're shaking your head no. How come? Absolutely, right? We keep oscillating back and forth between the y values positive 1 and negative 1 forever. If we find a very large x value, right, for which the value of sine of x is close to 1, Hayden can go and find a larger x value for which my y values are now back towards negative 1. And I can get arbitrary close to positive or negative 1 or any y value in between just by choosing a different larger value of x. And so because there's not a particular y value that the function values approach, in fact, there's an infinite number of y values in between positive 1 and negative 1 that the function values approach, as x still continues to get larger, increase without bond, there is no value of the limit. This does not exist. And so this doesn't equal anything. This does not exist. Good. Thank you, Sammy. Take a look at the limit as x goes to pi over 3 of cosine of x. Is my x value of concern in the domain of my expression? Allie? Yeah. Yes, and so this is becoming as easy as a direct substitution. This is the same as the cosine of, and then pi over 3. I know since you guys rock style your unit circle quiz to the top, then you know this by heart, and you don't need your grapher, and you can say the exact value. Turns out that my pi over 3 is right, cosine of pi over 3. It's nice that I don't even need a radical. So we should just get one half. And if we let x go to negative infinity, is there a particular y value that my cosine function approaches? No, for the same reason that number two. Uh, Sammy's explanation holds true for the last one as well. It does not exist, so it doesn't equal anything. Oh, boy. D N doesn't exist in none. Does not exist again. Awesome. Well, what if we consider a little more complicated trigonometric function? So sine and cosine are pretty smooth and well behaved, right? Nice continuous functions. What about tangent of x? Well, this time is my x value of concern in the domain, right? In the domain of my expression. No, it's not, right? So what are we going to do? Well, I could directly substitute in in um, pi over 2, but then I'm going to get my sine over cosine, I'm going to get a 0 on the bottom of a fraction, right? a 0 on the bottom of a fraction. However, I do know that my tangent function has vertical asymptotes, right? and so because I'm not getting an indeterminate form 0 over 0, I could consider the left-hand limit or the right-hand limit and perform a sine test and determine exactly the manner in which this overall limit does not exist. And so once again, I'm getting a constant over zero. My direct substitution is giving me sine over cosine, right? Sine over cosine. I'm getting a one over zero. That's not indeterminate. So I'm not going to try to rewrite this using algebraic means, but I do want to know which infinity it is. How do we do that? A sine test. And that's what we wrote down in our strategies from last class, right? Our analytic limits involving infinity, we can do a sine test to determine which of the infinities it will be. So let's do the left-hand limit. As we do the left-hand limit, 
I know that my fraction, my fraction of sine over cosine values that are just less than pi over 2 radians, just less than pi over 2 radians, will be just less than 90 degrees. Are my values of sine of x positive or negative, right, when I'm just less than pi over 2 radians? That's right here. Positive or negative? Positive. Are my values of cosine positive or negative when my radian measure input is just less than pi over 2 degrees? Also positive because I'm still in quadrant 1. So this would be positive over positive for my sign test. That's an indication that my final answer would be the positive infinity. So this is positive infinity, and that describes exactly the manner in which this function does not exist. Sorry. Yes, this function does not exist at x equals pi over 2, but we can say the limit goes to infinity as x approaches pi over 2 from the left-hand side. Contrast that with the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right-hand side. Recall that these are values of input theta that are just more than pi over 2 radians. And so now we're talking unit circle quadrant 2. In quadrant 2, are my values of sine positive or negative? Positive. Are my values of cosine positive or negative in quadrant 2? Negative. So what does that do for my answer? And now we're talking about negative infinity. And so my function values shoot towards negative infinity. Now all along we could have done this graphically. We could have done this graphically. As x approaches pi over 2, we're talking about As x gets closer and closer to pi over 2 from either side, we know our tangent function has those asymptotes. And so while we have, well, I'll just, uh, I can just draw. We know our tangent function has vertical asymptotes at every, at every pi over 2, both in the positive and negative direction, plus or minus n pi. And so as I look visually, as x gets closer and closer to pi over 2 for the left-hand side, what are my function values doing? Oh, they're increasing without bounds. If I let x approach pi over 2 from the right-hand side, what's happening to my function values? Oh, they're decreasing without bounds. And we know that because of our, our library of functions. It's pretty sweet. Oh, this is one of the most famous limits you'll see in Calc 1 classes across the country, the limit as x approaches 0, sine of x over x. Anna? Uh, so on the last question, someone would, um, like the limit of tangent of x as x approaches pi over 2, would that just not exist then? Yes, it does not exist. Sorry, thank you for asking. So this does not exist. By um, saying equals positive infinity or negative infinity for the one side limits, though, then we're clued in as to what the function is doing as you get closer and closer okay. from either side. Mm -hmm. But the overall limit does not exist. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So we will actually prove this, right, when we get into our discussion with, um, with sine and cosine and the derivatives, the derivatives of trigonometric functions. But for now, we'll do it graphically or numerically. So everybody, this is one I do want you to take a look on your graph. If everyone would kindly go to your graphing calculator. And in your graphing calculator, we're going to go ahead and make your y equals sine of x flows input all over x. So on my graph, I've got sine of x over x. And in my y equals menu, after entering it, I want to make sure that I'm in the correct mode. So you want to make sure that you're in radian mode, everyone. I know that depending upon what class you were in last, or if you're using this for physics or physics 2 or something, you might be in degree mode. We want to make sure that you're in radian mode. So I've gone into radian mode, and if I zoom 6, it's kind of hard to see what's going on, right? I can see that I've got an oscillating type function with a sort of down-up behavior. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom to, that's zoom in, enter. And I'm going to get a nice picture from negative 2.5 to positive 2.5. So everybody, after one zoom to enter from my standard zoom window, I've got a nice picture. If I trace, 
right? If I trace to hop on the function, when I press the trace button, my cursor normally jumps on the function. However, here, what y value is being paired with the x coordinate 0? No y value is paired with the x coordinate 0. How come? Yeah, the function does not exist at x equals 0 because that would create a 0 in the bottom of the fraction. We know that's not okay. However, initial substitution gives me 0 over 0. And so, in your past experience, when initial substitution results in a 0 over 0, does the limit typically exist or not exist? Yeah, it typically exists, doesn't it? In order to find it, we have to do some algebraic manipulation and rewrite it in such an expression form that we can plug in x equals 0. We're not going to do that today. This is a little bit more involved. However, we will evaluate the limit graphically. So I've traced. What if I go a little bit to the right? Looks like my y coordinates are about 0.999. What if I go a little bit to the left? Oh, it looks like it's about 0.999 also. So does anyone want to pause a guess as to what the value of this limit is? One. One? You think one? All right. So I could go and I could guess that it's one. And I could continue zooming. All right. And it looks like the left-hand limit matches the right-hand limit. Therefore, the overall limit exists and it is equal to one. We're going to see that next unit when we develop our trig derivative rules. So I'm excited about that. But for now, I want this. Will we fit it there? I think we will. I think we will. Super famous limit. Super famous limit. Okay. Uh, what about the limit of cosine of 1 over x as x goes to 0? Well, as x goes to 0, what's happening to this quotient 1 over 0? Is that indeterminate? Just the quotient 1 over 0. No, that's determinant, we can determine that that's infinite, right? 1 over 0, that's infinite. And so I'm going to be dealing with the cosine of some quantity that becoming infinite, right? And we saw earlier when we were trying to see what happened to cosine of x, the cosine function, as x got infinite, even though we were looking at negative infinity, was there an overall limit that existed? No, there was not. And so I'm guessing that this does not exist. Graphically, let's redefine our function y equals to be cosine of 1 over x close angle input. I'm going to leave it on the same window because I'm still letting x go to 0. So I want that nice negative 2 and a half to positive 2 and a half. And I'll see what that looks like. So it looks like as x gets closer and closer to 0. Whoa. What's going on there? Well, everything was going on fine when we were over here, right? And nice and smooth and well-behaved. And then as it got in towards the middle, it looks like it got a little jaggeder. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom to enter. Again, I'm going to zoom to enter as for zooming in. And nice and smooth, and nice and smooth. And then, whoa! And it looks, in fact, like uh, one of the earthquake seismographs or something like that is it continues to oscillate, right? More quickly and more quickly. And that makes sense. As this input becomes infinite, right, the cosine function in general oscillates forever and ever back and forth between between positive one and negative one. If I continue zooming, right, and zooming and zooming, I would continue to be able to oscillate more and more back and forth. And so it's just going to become more and more of a mess, like a, a plucked guitar string. We've got this oscillation back and forth. Okay, so what can we say then? Does this equal one? Does it equal negative one? Does it equal zero? No, this is going to be, it does not exist because the, there's no particular y value that the function values approach as they get closer and closer to x equals zero. In fact, they continue to oscillate more and more quickly back and forth between positive one and negative one. It just gets quicker. Oscillation. So this does not exist. That's cool. In a mathy limit evaluation sort of way. What about the limit then as x approaches infinity of sine of one over x? The limit of x approaches infinity of sine of 1 over x. So again, in our head, this is kind of like a two-step evap, a composition of function. Right? We're not just talking about sine of x. We're talking about sine of 1 over x. And so what's happening to my input 1 over x, the fraction only, as x goes to infinity? Can we do this without a calculator? Yeah, what happens to 1 over x as x goes to infinity? Approaches 0, right? Is 0 within the domain of my overall sine function? It is, and produces what output? 
zero. And so if we think about this in terms of a composition of functions, I'm guessing that this should be zero. I'm guessing that this should be zero. All right, let's do a quick verification and we can get on with the party. So it looks like sine of, well, first, when I'm cleared out, I'm going to zoom six, because so I, I don't know how many times I zoomed in. <laughs> I'm getting a crazy picture no matter what. And I'm going to do y equals sine of, and we'll do one over x. I'm going to go ahead and go to a table here because I want to let x go to infinity. So my little negative 10 to 10 window is not going to do very good. What do I want to do? Well, since I was in advanced algebra before, I need to fix my independent to ask it. I feel so uncomfortable when my independent is on auto. You know what I mean? Like, I want the control. I want to be able to input an x value and see what output is produced for y. So I'm going to go to ask. And what am I going to ask it? Well, I want to know when x gets big, like 100. Like a thousand, like ten thousand, right? So what's up? Oh, what's happening on my y values? Yeah, that e stands for exponent, right? Short notation. This is like one times ten to the negative seventh power. That's point zero 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 six zero one. That's very very close. Right? Very small rocks. Very small. Very small rocks, very close to zero, and so I'm confident that my initial analytical reasoning holds true when I verify that with the tape through numerical inspection. Awesome. How are you guys doing with your analytic limit evaluation? A little bit more every day? Dysfunction behavior, right? Dysfunction behavior, and I've tried to break it up into kind of doses. So we can think about it for a little bit each day and not after 15 minutes be mental overload, right? I'm trying to do all these in one day. All right. So let's go ahead and close out our discussion with a little natural log. I haven't seen natural log for a little while. So as x goes to 0 from the right-hand side, what does ln of x do? And perhaps it's easiest to do this. Perhaps it's easiest to do this analytically using your knowledge of function behavior. And so over here, as I'm thinking about my graph of y equals ln of x, Recall that's our parent natural logarithmic function, and I've got my vertical asymptote at x equals zero. I've got key points one comma zero. And recall that the natural logarithmic function does grow, right, and increase to infinity as x approaches infinity. It just does so very, very slowly. Right, very, very slowly. And so this does increase forever, and eventually my y values will approach infinity as x increases without bounds. As x gets closer and closer to zero, my y values are decreasing without bound. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So let's go ahead and connect these with our limit question. As x goes to zero from the right, what does ln of x do? Well, it goes to negative infinity, but it goes to negative infinity. As x goes to infinity, what does ln of x do? It goes to positive infinity. And the limit of ln x as x goes to 1, recall, we need, right, we need to consider both the left hand and the right hand side. But as we know from function behavior here, we know that the function is defined at x equals 1 and the y value produced is 0. Furthermore, the left hand limit matches the right hand limit. So my analytic answer would go right to 0. And it's a good thing we remember our library functions, right? It's a good thing we can remember those things. What questions do you guys have on your analytic limit evals? All right. As x goes to negative infinity, we can do this a long way or we can do it a short way, right? Uh, I'm thinking about breaking up absolute value bars. Right? I'm thinking about breaking up absolute value bars in the past. However, we did that as a means for evaluating a limit when my initial substitution resulted in an indeterminate form and I had to rewrite. As x goes to negative infinity, am I getting into an indeterminate form? Well, it turns out that I am. It's just not the one that we've seen, right? We're used to getting 0 over 0 for an indeterminate form. Here, I'd really be getting infinity over infinity, right? As x goes to infinity, then absolute value of x, I'm sorry, negative infinity, then absolute value of x goes to infinity times 2 is, 2 times infinity is even bigger over 
infinity. And then this addition by one and subtraction, or uh, addition or subtraction by two, right, is not going to change the overall value. So again, you can consider dominant, right? You can consider dominant terms, top and bottom, when evaluating a limit that approaches infinity. And so as you do this, you can think about your end behavior model. And so I don't care that I don't have a polynomial here, right? I know that that addition or subtraction by one or two is going to have no effect on the end behavior of this function. So it will be determined by the dominant term. And so it looks to me like I'm getting like y equals 2 absolute value of x over absolute value of x. As x approaches negative infinity, right, this absolute value of x is still going to return the positive. And so this is still like 2 times x plus x, and that's still like 2. So as x goes to negative infinity, overall, this limit is going to go to 2. All right, finally, initial substitution of our, our, rational, our rational expression here gives us constant negative 2 over 0. Is this an indeterminate form? No, no. 0 over 0 is indeterminate. Constant over 0, that's infinite, right? It's going to be one of the infinities, either positive infinity or negative infinity. How do we tell which? Well, we do the sign test. And so now when we get to do our sign test, as x approaches negative 2 from the left hand side, my top is a constant that's negative. Over, as x approaches negative 2 from the left hand side, that's numbers like negative 2.01, bless you, negative 2.001, negative 2.0001, ensuring that the sign of my denominator will be what? Positive or negative? Negative. negative. So overall, I'm considering a negative value divided by a negative value is going to give us a positive infinity. So this should be a positive infinity. Pretty sweet. And when to go, go ahead and do the last one with your partner then. And let's see what value you guys are getting or not. Or not a value for the last one. Check with your partner and be ready to share with the whole class. Okay, as you did initial substitution, I got 1 over 0, that's infinite. Then I considered a sign test. What kind of values is, is x take on as it approaches 3 from the left? So what kind of values does x take on as x approaches 3 from the left? Paul? 2.9, Good. Ensuring that the sign of my denominator will be what? Riley? Negative, right? Because we're letting x approach 3 from the left, it's going to ensure that the sign of the denominator is negative. Therefore, my infinite form, positive infinity or negative infinity, is going to be positive divided by negative, and that answers our question. It's going to be negative. So that's going to be negative. And we can do that without the calculator. Raise your hand if you already have negative infinity. Great, and thanks for your help, you guys. Way to go. That's awesome. All right, so today we're going to go ahead and get our last, our last, um, uh, activity stamps of the unit. And so we've got our intermediate value handout today. Our handout is just uh, one page. One page is where we're going to get the stamps, and then on the back we're going to actually do together in a whole group. If you've gotten your stamp, your sixth stamp, before other groups have, then you can continue working together on the back. However, once the last group has gotten their sixth stamp, we're going to come back together and have a whole group discussion leading up to our closure and then assignment, our OTL number four. Okay, so once again, after the last group has gotten six, then we're going to go ahead and rejoin for a um, for a whole group discussion. Okay, awesome. So, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'd ask that you go ahead and scoot your desks together into your regular cooperative learning groups.
We'll go ahead and get started on your Pyramid Valley handout, and after the last week, get six, but we'll come back together. Thanks for getting going right away. I appreciate that. And I'll pause the recording. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Raise your hand if you did not get your six stand. Everybody good? Okay, so let's see our findings. For our number, number one, two, and three, I drew an arbitrary function, right, f, uh, on the interval a to b, such that my, my vertical line, my vertical lines for my x values a and b, right, intersected my function values there at y values f at a and f at b. So if I'm a continuous function over the interval a to b, if I were to choose some arbitrary y value in between f at a and f at b, call it y sub 1, is there a value, an x value, x equals c, such that the value of the function f of c is the same as that y coordinate somewhere along the picture? Yes. And where along the picture must that c value exist? Right? What was our 3 stand? Where along our picture must that c value be found? Riley? Yeah, in between A and B. In fact, if I were to extend this, it looks like I, I get it several times. So I get C sub 1. I get another place down here, C sub 2. And another place over here, C sub 3. All of those are x equals C values that are in between A and B. So if I have a continuous function on the interval A to B, and I choose a y value, y sub 1, that's in between f at a and f at b, then we have no choice, right, but for some x value, call it x equals c, to exist where the value of the function f of c is equal to y, y sub 1. What about our second block, 4, 5, 6 questions? I drew an arbitrary function that was discontinuous there, right, and depending upon your picture, you may be able to choose some y value, call it y sub 1, that is between f at a and f at b. However, where there's no x equals c value for which the value of the function f of c is equal to y sub 1. If I choose my y1 anywhere in between this range here of y values, then there's no place where the function equals my y value that I pick. And so if the original, the original hypothesis, that is that f is continuous on my interval f, uh, a to b, then it does not guarantee the existence of some, some x equals c value where the function value is, equals my arbitrarily chosen y value. Let's go ahead and summarize this as the intermediate value here. So if f of x is continuous on interval a to b, and y is some number between f at a and f of b, then there's guaranteed to be some x equals c between a and b such that f of c equals y. That is, my value of the function is equal to my y value of concern. This is the intermediate value theorem, and we can now apply it in several situations. Okay, so the class is an example, right, that I have. You get up in the morning and you're hearing your parents listening to Charlie Chartino in the background. And if we have the day's temperature as a function of the time of day, oh, let's do the number of hours since midnight. Let's do the number of hours since midnight, right? We could have a little train tracks here, and we'll just start off at 5, 6, 7, and then we could go, you know, all the way out, whatever. And then we could have our y-axis be the degrees Fahrenheit for the temperature, right, as the day progresses. So here we would have our f at 5, my f at 5, my degrees Fahrenheit at time t equals 5 hours since midnight, and that be, might be something like 52, right? Meanwhile, back at 4 in the afternoon, right, at 4 in the afternoon or 16 hours since midnight, right? We might have something like 73. Would this be an example of a continuous function on my interval, 5 to 16? Absolutely, right? There's no way to get from 52 degrees to 73 degrees in the afternoon without going through every single temperature value in between. And so while this does not have to be a linear function, right, in, in fact, of course, is likely not, 
the only way to get from there, right, to here, is to go through every single degree Fahrenheit in between, right, every single temperature. And so I'd have to have, I'd have to have some, I'd have to have some continuous function over my interval 5 to 16. Now let's choose an arbitrary value, a y value in between. What y value would you like to use? Preston. 60. 60. Is 60 in between 52 and 73? Yes, it is. Then what does the intermediate value theorem guarantee? It guarantees the existence of some x value in between 5 and 16. In this case, it looks to be about... Uh, nice axis labeling this with bricks, but I'm going to go for... 10. Is 10 in between 5 and 16? For which the value of my function, in this case degrees Fahrenheit at 10 a.m., is 60 degrees. And so that's what the intermediate value theorem says. Let's go ahead and use it to answer some questions. Let's use the intermediate value theorem to conclude there is a value for x equals c between 0 and 1 for which f of c is equal to 1. This is the same as your practice questions where you have a little bit more space. I put them on the note file as well. So this is the same questions. You can do it either place, it doesn't matter. All right? You can do it either place, it doesn't matter. There's not going to be a separate practice stamp here at, at the end, so you can do it in your notes or you can do it on the practice space where you get a little bit more space. All right, so what do we need, what do we need in order to apply the intermediate value theorem? Well, in order to apply the intermediate value theorem, we need to be a continuous function f over some interval. As I consider this function definition for f, x cubed minus 3x squared minus 6x plus 8, do I have a continuous function? Yes. How do we know? How do we know that's a continuous function? Well, because uh, it has a denominator of 1. Like, there's no point at which it is discontinuous. Well, yeah, and the, the function itself, right? If you're thinking about a rational function, a rational function is, uh, is composed of polynomial numerator and polynomial denominator. In this case, f is a cubic polynomial, and we know that all polynomials are defined for all x values, right, in their, in their, in their domain. And so it, this polynomial function, since f is a polynomial, it's continuous for all input x's. So since f is a polynomial, f is continuous for all x values. consider my f at a and f at b and choose a y value, right, that's in between it and see how that relates in our problem. So f of 0 equals, and we can go ahead and evaluate that function to see what f of 0 is. f of 0 would be 0 cubed minus 3 times 0 minus 6 times 0 plus 8 is 8. And f at 1, right, would be my f of b my y coordinate of my endpoint. And that would be given by what? Well, I don't know. Let's do it. 1 cubed minus 3 times 1 is minus 3 minus 6 plus 8. So I'm getting 1 minus 3 is negative 2 minus 6 is negative 8 plus 8 is 0. You guys getting 0? Awesome. So f of 0 is 8 and f of 1 equals 0. What were we asked to do? We were asked to conclude that there's some value for x, call it x equals c, between 0 and 1, that's my a and b, for which f of c is equal to 1. So what's my y value of concern? Is my y value of concern 8? No. Is it 0? No. My y value of concern is 1. Since 0 is less than y equals 1 is less than 8. The intermediate value 
here. It's guarantees. And x equals c value. On a to b, such that f of c equals y equals y. So we had to say that f was continuous. We had to check that my y value 1 was in between f at a and f at b, in this case, in between 0 and 8. Then the intermediate value theorem does the work. So what's your job? Your job is to guarantee the prerequisites. You need a continuous function, and you need to check that your y value of concern is in between your endpoint y values, f at a and f at b. If those prerequisites are met, then the intermediate value theorem guarantees the sum existing. An important note. The intermediate value theorem is an existence theorem. It guarantees the existence of some x equals c value. It doesn't tell you how many c values there are, or how to find them, or what they are. It just guarantees the existence. We could certainly go and find that c value, right, using um, using a solver on our calculator, or solving graphically or numerically, or second calculate intersect, or second calculate zero, or whatever, and that's fine. But for now, we just needed to conclude that there is a value for to c. And I did more work on, on my piece. Let's try another. Use the intermediate value theorem to prove there's a real number which equals root 3. What? We're going to prove that there's a real number that equals the square root of 3? Yeah, and the intermediate value theorem is going to be our tool to do so. So what do we need? Well, we need some function, right? And we need it to be continuous. So let's choose a function that will be useful for us. We need it to be continuous, and we want to get to the existence of root 3. And so that is c squared equals 3 would mean that, right, that c equals uh, root 3. So I'm going to go ahead and choose my function f to be x squared. I'm going to let f of x equals x squared. Which is a continuous, a continuous function because it's a polynomial. So f is a polynomial, therefore it's continuous for all x values in the domain. Now, f at one equals one squared equals what? One, right? And f at 2 equals what? 4. Now we'll let y equals 3. Since 1 is less than 3 equals y is less uh, is less than 4. My y value of concern, 3, is in between 1 and 4. The intermediate value here guarantees The existence of some x value, call it c, on the interval 1 to 4, sorry, 1 to 2, such that f of c equals y, that is, c squared, isn't that f of c? Go to my function and evaluate when x equals c. c squared equals, what's y? 3. If c squared equals 3, then c equals the positive and negative square root of 3. And which of these two values is on my interval 
zero to one. I'm sorry, one to two. The positive root three. And so we want the positive one. Whoops. What do we need to prove? What, what, what do we need to do the work for? We need to establish the prerequisites. The prerequisites are continuous function f, and my y value concern is in between f of a and f of b, the so y coordinates of my endpoint. If I can establish those prerequisites, then the interior value can never guarantee the rest. Thanks. Why did you pick 1 and 2 for a and b? Great question. I'm going to let somebody else answer. Why did we pick 1 and 2 for a and b? We weren't given a and b, right? Why do we pick those? Anna? We just know that like square root of 3 is in between. Points. Yes. Because my square root of 3, right, my, my I, I'm going to say that 3 is in between 1 and 4, right? When I do the square root of that, that's how I'm getting the square root of 3. So we choose these just because of our function. We needed to make outputs, right, where 3 was in between. And those are convenient values to do so. Great questions, great answers. Thank you. Allie. So then could you like use f of 1 and then also like do like f of 3? Like would it just be like broader than like is that a problem? That's not a problem. So long as your y value concern is in between 1 and 9, and it is, then the mean value theorem, I'm sorry, the intermediate value theorem guarantees the existence of some x equals c value. Absolutely. So we could have done 0 to 2 or 0. Five. Awesome. All right, let's take a look at another. Suppose f is continuous on a to b and that f at a is positive and f at b is negative. What will the intermediate value theorem ensure exists for this function? What? This is kind of a different, this is a different question. We haven't done one like this, right? We haven't done one like this. Uh, and so, if f's continuous on a to b, that's one prerequisite, right? What's our other prerequisite? What's our other prerequisite? Our y value, our y value of concern has to be in between f at a and f at b. Well, we don't know what f at a is, but we know that it's positive, and we don't know what f at b is, but we know that it's negative. So what could we conclude using the intermediate value theorem? Thinking. Yeah, somewhere in between A and B, there must be, what's that called from my function? When it crosses the x-axis? Yeah. A zero. There must be a zero, right? There must be a zero of the, of the function. Great. All right, so let's go ahead and write that. So how can we write something like that? Suppose f is continuous on A and B and that f at A is positive and f at B is negative. What will the intermediate value theorem ensure exists for this function? Let's let y equal 0 since f is continuous, that we're given. And And y is in between f of b and f of a. And I switched the order there just because they said negative for f of b. So I did less than, right? Increasing order. The intermediate value theorem guarantees an x equals c value on my interval a to b. where f of c equals 0, that is, f has a 0 on the graph. Or an x-intercept, right? Here's someone talking about intercept, where f has an x-intercept. Well, 
yeah, right? This makes sense entirely for continuous functions. If I have to trace through every single y coordinate in between f at a and f at b, the y values of my endpoints, it makes sense that I should have to cross through, I should have to cross through a particular y value of my choosing. Your burden just is to determine that the polynomial is continuous, I'm sorry, the function is continuous on that interval, and the y value of concern is in between the y coordinates of my endpoint. All right, let's go ahead and close it up for the day, and then we'll have a chance to work on our OTL for the first time this, this year, so that's kind of nice. In order to guarantee the existence of some x equals c on a to b such that f of c equals y, what must be true about the function f? Don't say it out loud, just write it down. What must be, must be true about the value y? And I'd like to see a written response for everyone, and then I'll have you share. What has to be true about my function f? What must be true about my function f? Kobe? That's continuous from Good. A to B. Absolutely. My function f has to be continuous on my interval a to b. Good. if you had the first star. But the first star? Great! Oh, what about that second star? So as I was walking around, right, I saw lots of lots of inconsistency here. I know that my value y, right, my value y that I'm selecting has to be in between not a and b, right? Those my x values are concerned. My value y has to be in between my f at a and f at b. So my y value has to be between the y coordinates and the endpoints. And so I would show that by writing y must be in between f at a and f at b. Okay, not a and b, those are x values. But we saw that my 60 degrees, my 60 degrees was not in between. 5 and 16. Right? That's not in between 5 and 16. It was in between 52 and 73. Awesome. What questions do you guys have about our discussion today? Then these last two slides are just your OTL number 4. So you guys can go ahead and use this time to get started. If you'd like to work with a partner quietly, you may. But I do ask that during AP Calculus time, you use it to work on AP Calculus. And so now's not a time just to visit or to work on it, work on your com art, or get caught up. On your A-course reading, instead I ask you to work on A-B calculus. Okay, thank you, you guys. I'll go ahead and save these notes and stop the recording now. <laughs>